right. Okay, we're going to start with a quick rapid fire Slack question. So here you go. As fast as you can, pull out your phones. This is my question to you. When I tell you that I'm preaching today about the story of Jesus walking on water, what comes to your mind? Okay, it's a very famous story, Jesus walking on water. What comes to your mind when I say I'm preaching on that? So like the characters, what happens, that kind of thing, okay? So we're back in our sermon series on John, and we're doing the seven signs on John. And uh, so when I got the, uh, when Rob said, okay, you're going to preach this one, and it's on Jesus walking on water, I was like, awesome. I'm going to preach on Peter and like, you know, uh, the faith and then the sinking and the eyes on Jesus, and it's going to be all good, right? So, what do you guys think I'm preaching on? Yep, Peter sinking. Uh, yeah, Peter needing Jesus not to sink. Awesome. Cool. Great. Okay. Let's read John 6, 15 to 21. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. No Peter, no sinking, nothing like that. So I'm like, okay, if John didn't include it, what is it then that John wants us to learn from this story? All right, so let's put this story in context. Uh, verse 15 says, Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So this is the verse, the, in this verse, the they in this verse is the 5,000 that he's just fed, which you'll remember from my last sermon I preached a few weeks ago before we went into the plan. So the they is the 5,000. And in, verse, in the verse right before that, verse 14, they said, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. So they've identified him as the prophet, and now they want to take him and forcibly make him king. And Jesus is having none of it, and he escapes up into the mountain, and leaves them there. Um, so, the disciples are left behind. And they're down, and they're like, where did Jesus go? Uh, we don't know where Jesus is. And they're hanging out, and they're trying to figure it out. And so, I can kind of picture it. They're having this discussion. They don't know where Jesus is. And one of them's like, we don't know kind of how long Jesus was gone. One of them's like, okay, you know what we should do? We should get in the boat, and we should go home. Because Capernaum is where Peter and Andrew and Matthew are from. So they get into the boat. It's dark. It's stormy. And it's windy. And it says, the sea became rough because the strong wind was blowing. So here they are in the dark. The wind is blowing them off course, and they are about halfway across the lake. And they are in trouble because they didn't wait for Jesus. So my next class slack question to you is, did you ever get tired of waiting for Jesus and set out on your own? And what were the consequences? So as I was preparing this sermon, Rob was like, this would be a really good place for a story from your life. And I was like, okay, because I prepared the sermon a few weeks ago. And then this week I was meeting with Rob and I'm like, I can't come up with a story because they're either too dark or too light. And so I'm like, uh, so we talked it out and I'm like, okay, this is my story of when I didn't wait for Jesus. Uh, when I was 10 years old and my parents were 30, we started attending church and my mom became a Christian and then my dad became a Christian. And then I was told if I become a Christian, I don't have to burn in hell because it was the 80s and that's how we did evangelism back then. And I was like, Burning in hell, bad. Heaven with Jesus, good. So I became a Christian. And then I went through my teen years, and uh, I was in a church that was like, 
Christians do this, and they don't do this. And this is good, and this is bad. And some of it's right. Christians don't murder. We can all agree with that. Christians don't steal things. That's good, too. And then they're like, Christians don't listen to, to rock music. We can only listen to classical music because Jesus was only a classical musician. He was not a rock musician. And I was like, this doesn't, this doesn't really seem kind of right to me. So at about 18, I was like, you know what? This church thing, it doesn't seem like what I want to do. Uh, I think I know better. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I am going to uh, take over my life. I'm going to drop out of school. I'm going to become a cashier at Loblaws where they pay big money. They were paying me like 10 bucks an hour when everyone else was making 5 bucks an hour. And this is going to be my life. And when I was 18, Frank and Wendy were some of the stupidest people that I knew. And it's funny the older I got, the smarter they got, and they claim they didn't change at all. So I don't know if that works out. But anyway, I drop out of school. I'm working at Law Laws. I am having fun on the Saturday night and waking up and dragging myself to church on Sunday morning. And finally, my parents are like, if you will go to university, we will pay for you to go to university. And I was like, okay, I don't really want to be a cashier my whole life. But I had not done exceptionally well in school. So my options were fairly limited. But Christian schools will take anybody as long as you give them money. So we were looking around. And, um, and I was like, I am not going to Bible school because the only thing I know I'm not going to be is a pastor. So that ruled out Bible schools. But there was this school in BC called Trinity Western University. And at the time, it was literally the only degree-granting school in Canada that was Christian. Now there's a lot more of them. But back then, if you went to any other Christian school, you got a Bachelor of Religious Education. And if you went to here, you just got like a regular BA. So I was like, BC, far enough away from Frank and Wendy. Sounds good. Let's do it. So off I went. But I was still in charge of my own life. And I was like, I can do this Christian thing on Monday to Friday, and I can do what I want on the weekends. And I did that for about two years. And let me just tell you, I made a mess of my life while I was out there. I stayed out one summer between second and third year. And after a bad weekend, I woke up. And uh, I felt like God was saying to me, that's enough. I got this picture in my mind, actually. It was like a dog that was on a chain. And I was, like, running as fast away as I could. And then I got to the end of the chain, and it, like, jolted me back. And I felt like God was saying to me, that's enough. It's your turn to pick. No more of this one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. You need to decide what you want to do. And I looked around and thought, well, I messed this up pretty bad. Here's all my broken pieces. Let's see what we can do when you're in charge of my life, Jesus. And that's when I would say, I went from Jesus just being my savior and what I called fire insurance to Jesus being Lord of my life, where I let him direct what I was doing. And from then on, I have been perfect since then which we know is not true. Because God doesn't make us perfect, he actually works in us to make us more like him. And so it's funny. I got that picture, that would be about 30 years ago. And as I was uh, praying this morning uh, in the shower to do this sermon, I, was, I got the other half of the picture. So we have this fabulous dog named Ninja, if you've met her. And she is the most disobedient dog you have ever met in your life. She will not listen. So when we put her outside, or when Frank and Wendy put her outside, because she loves to be outside, so we can't, whatever, you have to put her on a chain. And then she can go sort of just in this radius. And, of course, she chases chipmunks and gets her little neck slapped back. But this weekend, my son was at our place with his big German shepherd, and her name is Ella. And you can open the door and you can let Ella out because when Sam says come, Ella comes back. Because Sam's voice is something Ella listens to. And I realize now that 
I don't have to be on a chain anymore because I hear the voice of God when he speaks to me. And there's freedom in that. And it allows me to do the things that he's called me to do without having to have those restrictions on me. And yes, I'm still a work in progress, but I'm not the same that I was when I was 22. And I hope I'm not the same as I will be in another 30 years. And Frank and Wendy are not nearly as stupid as they used to be, so they're actually kind of smart. <laughs> so I'm going to go back to Slack. I have to find out where we were. Corey, you're supposed to put the question in so I can find it. Um, so some of the answers are like all the time, and I'm always learning. Too often, especially when I was a young Christian, and uh, when he is taking too long to bring me to the next step, so I try to go on without him. Isn't that always the way? Uh, so in my last story, in the feeding of the 5,000, John was comparing Jesus to Moses, the first prophet. And this is to convince the Jews that this is the, the prophet that they're waiting for. There's a similar story in the life of Moses to what we have here with the, di the, the disciples. So in Exodus 32.1, it says, When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, up, make us gods. Who shall go before us? For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And then this story goes on to talk about making the, the making of the golden calf and uh, the, by Aaron and the people started to worship it. And so while Moses is up on the mountain having a conversation with God, the people are down below getting impatient and making bad decisions. Exodus 32, 7 to 10 says, And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. And therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. The people of Israel are about to suffer the consequences of, what they, uh, the consequences of going on ahead of their leader and making their own decisions. In verse 11, we read, But Moses implored, the Lord is God. Moses stepped in on behalf of the people of Israel and on behalf of the people he was leading, and he, and he saved them from God's wrath. In John 6, 19, we see Jesus doing the same thing for his disciples. They are at about three or four miles from land, and Jesus comes walking towards them to save them. They are so caught up in the chaos that they, that they have caused themselves that they see him coming, and they're afraid. Seeing that they're terrified, Jesus says, it is I, do not be afraid. And then, of course, they're happy to let him into the boat, and then they're safely on the other side. In the Expositor's Bible Commentary, it says, as the multiplication of the loaves and fishes showed his power over matter, so the walking on the water revealed his divine power over the forces of nature. It was one more step in the education of his disciples' faith. Jesus isn't just the king of Israel. Jesus is actually the king over the whole universe. And John makes this clear in the beginning of his gospel when he says in John 1, 1 to 4, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The disciples have now seen firsthand how miraculous Jesus is. Nothing is outside of his control. That revel the revelation that they have, that they receive, of how powerful Jesus is will remain with them for the rest of their lives. The interesting thing is that they're the only ones that see what happened here in this verse. 
The chapter goes on to say in, from, in John 6, 22 to 26, On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the, after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd said that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Jesus actually sides sidesteps their question, and he doesn't answer him. And then he goes on for another 40 verses to talk about how they're seeking bread, like the bread that he gave out when he fed them, and he's the bread of life. And if they really want to be, if they really want that life, they actually have to eat him like we do in communion. They have to be part of him. They have to enter into him. And it ends with them saying, uh, this is a hard saying, who can listen? John 6 concludes like this, 66 to 69. After this, many of his disciples turned away and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Why? Why is that? Why was their response different than the response of all the other people? Those people had seen miracles. They'd seen some of the things he's done. But why was it too hard for them, and it was okay for the disciples? It's because they didn't have the same revelation of God. They didn't see the last miracle that he did as the 12 did. What revelation of God have you received that causes you to know that Jesus is the Holy One of God? We kind of see this in our world today, and previously in Christendom. We've kind of set up this social construct that says that uh, Christians are good people, and we do good things, and then God does good to us, right? Right? And so, um, as long as we're behaving, we're being blessed, and when we do bad things, we get cursed. Except that that starts to fall apart when times get hard. And so, it has to be more than just a set of rules that we follow. And also, let's be honest, Christians are not the only ones that do good things. We don't hold the high ground. We don't think that we, we're not the only ones. And so we need to have more than just an understanding of what's good and bad. It's funny, uh, as evangelical Christians, I've heard this said a lot, that uh, Christianity, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. It's like, like we, you know, we're not just following through. But even that seems a little bit too small. Because it's not like, yeah, like, Jesus is my best friend, and, like, we just walk and talk together. It's more than that. We actually need to have a revelation that Jesus isn't just my best friend. He created the entire universe. He is the God that can walk on water and do miracles and do what you need in your life. Do we really understand how powerful our God is? So in the answer to the question, what revelation of God have you received that causes you to know that Jesus is the Holy One of God? My biggest revelation was that I may not be worthy, but I'm worth it. That's an awesome one. 
Every time I start to doubt or have to think about who Jesus is to me, I think back to the day I was baptized, and when I come, come back up from the water, it felt like a weight off my shoulders and just an outpouring of love. I can't really put it fully into words, but I think of it to this day. And that I am redeemable is a great revelation as I trip. So here's my question as we conclude on this very chilly morning. <laughs> Have you had a revelation of God in your life? Do you truly understand that he's the God that controls the universe? If you have, and if you do, how does it impact your life? Will you turn away from the things that he has called you to, or will you follow him because you have come to know that he is the Holy One of God? See, that decision, it's Joel mentioned it in Slack today, that decision that the disciples made set in motion the destiny of the church that we're in today. Armed with a revelation of who Jesus really was, they spread the gospel to the ends of the earth, and most of them were martyred in the process. We now have the opportunity to continue that legacy as we embrace a revelation of who Jesus is. Will we take it? Can I pray for you? God, I thank you that you don't leave us in our little baby relationships with you, Lord, but that as we seek you and as we desire a revelation of you, that you will do amazing things in us, you will do amazing things through us, and that you will not leave us as we were. And so, God, I pray this morning that each person here, if they've not already have a, had a revelation of who you are, will get that revelation and understand that they have the privilege of serving the God of the universe and that he has plans for us and he has purposes for us when we listen for his voice and follow his direction. In Jesus' name, amen.